Good afternoon. Happy Sunday, everybody. It is uh, about time to get this day kicked off, and so I wanted to do my daily reading. Uh, this is The Tongue, A Creative Force, Chapter 3. This is going to be a little bit longer than uh, the other chapters, so we're just going to power through it and get through it and have a great day. So this is Chapter 3, Christian Sense. When you continually affirm and confess, I thank God, though it looks like the mountain's problem, the mountain's problem, getting bigger, it's not. In the name of Jesus, I see it removed by the eye of faith. Somebody will say, only a nut will say that. If the mountain's still there, the trouble is still there. And you know it's there, you can't deny its existence. You see, sometimes when I start teaching on this, folks will say it sounds like Christian science. One lady punched her husband in a service in, in Texas and said, my wife overheard them. That sounds like Christian science. It's not Christian science. It's what Brother Kenneth Hagin says. It's Christian sense. I don't deny the existence of the mountain. I deny the right of, its, of it to exist in my way. I don't see it as being in my way. I see it in the way the word said it, removed. The word says, the just shall live by faith, Hebrews 10, 38, and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But a lot of Christians are walking by sight and not by faith. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose you are driving down a highway at 60 miles per hour. Someone pulls out three blocks ahead of you, and they're, they are right in the middle of the road, crossways. You slam on your brakes and say, there's a car right in the middle of the road. A car from behind hits you, and suddenly there's a 10-car pileup. Somebody says, what's wrong with you? You say, well, there was a car in the road. Well, sure it was, but it was doing 30 miles an hour just two more seconds, and it would have been gone. You were going totally by what you saw. You observed what was there, and you slammed on the brakes. That is what a lot of Christian people are doing, too. Woo! It's there, and it's still there. You've established it. But if you will confess its removal, praise God, when you get there, it's going to be gone. You see, if you drive your car the way you've been driving your spiritual life, you would have wrecked that thing a dozen times. You can see that. You don't pay any attention to the car out there three blocks up the road. The computer in your head is telling you he's going 30 miles per hour in two more seconds. He'll be on the other side of that road. There is no danger. I'll just keep going. And you sit there, and you see that car, and you never flinch. You never reach for the brakes. You just drive along perfectly at ease. Why? Because you have faith in what the, that guy is doing. You are actually believing something you are not seeing. You are believing the end results. Driving your car successfully is based on split-second timing. Now, he may decide just to throw on his brakes right there and stop. Then you would want to know what was wrong with him. Apply that when the storms of life come against you and the devil says, look, they, look here, you will never be able to get over that. Just ignore him and say, thank God I believe the word. It will not be there when I get there. That kind of faith will move mountains. You may get to the foot of the mountain sometimes before it moves. It will either move or there will be a hole come in it. But if, I, if you go to mealing mouthing around, and say, I believe it's getting slower. I don't believe it's going to leave. You're in trouble. Jesus said, to the, say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Say what you want done with it. Don't go to God in prayer. Dear God, it's getting worse. He said that you can have what you say. And you said it's getting worse. That ought to tell you something. Jesus said the God kind of faith works by the word of your mouth. There is no release of God kind of faith without the words of the mouth. It is released by the words of your mouth. In Luke 17, 5 through 6, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, increase our faith. Give us more faith. And the Lord said, if ye, if ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the seed and it should obey you. They were standing there by that tree. It probably wasn't close to a mountain. He said that that tree should obey you. 
He didn't say a word about increasing their faith. In other words, he said, you've got to learn what to use what you have. He said, the way you use it is to start saying some things in faith. Plant the seed. Many people have desired healing. They want a harvest of healing and they want and a harvest of physical needs met. But they have never planted a seed. The law of Genesis says everything produces after its kind. I could be the best rice farmer in the state of Arkansas. And I could sit in my house and say, praise God, I believe in rice. My grandfather believed in rice. My daddy believed in rice. My brother believes in rice. Everybody ought to have a field of rice. I could have 10 tons of seed on my truck waiting to be planted. But if I just sit there and praise God and believe in the rice and never act on what I know to plant the seed, I'll never harvest any rice. A lot of Christians are doing that. They're saying, I believe in the Lord. The Lord's able. Yes, brother, I believe he is able to mm -hmm. heal me. Well, the devil knows that the Lord is able. That's no profound statement. The thing you must determine is, will he? The word says he will, and then you must start agreeing with that. The word is what works. It's not your prayer that works. It's the word and faith that works. Prayer won't make faith work. We've, we've thought if we just pray long enough, it would, work, it, it would soon work out. No, it won't. We need to get this straightened out. Faith will, not, will make prayer work, but prayer won't make faith work. Faith will work without prayer. Prayer won't work without faith. Now we can, we have determined that from the word of God that you can have what you say. Not many people do because they have never controlled their words. Jesus said it. It didn't say it. I'm just telling you what he said. Now I'm smart enough to believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about. Jesus has made a profound statement that you can have what you say through the knowledge of God. Let's read 2 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. How is grace and peace going to be multiplied to you? Through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord? What is some of the knowledge of God? How his faith works. How does God's faith work? If you find how his faith works, you will know how your faith is going to work. God never did anything without saying it first. And you hardly do either. You say, I'm going uptown. I'm going to work. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do that. You always say it before you do it. You are programmed to operate that way. So if you don't say some things in faith concerning some of the things you believe, you will never operate in faith in those areas. The word says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, We, having the same belief of a same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. 2 Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power hath given us all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. His divine power has given us all things. How? Through the knowledge of God. He is saying that if you get the knowledge of God, then you have the understanding of God, the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is the word of God. Then he said, He hath given to you by his divine ability all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, if healing doesn't pertain to life, what does? Finances also pertain to life. Paul said, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.18 Having abundant supplies to life and godliness, you ought to have abundant abundance. In the name of Jesus, the word says you can. If you act on the word of faith, if you begin to do it. Now, this won't happen overnight. That's the thing. I want you to bear hard in this book. It won't happen overnight. It won't happen just because you say it one or two times. It is going to happen because you continually affirm what God's word says until it gets into your spirit and becomes part of you. James 1.21 says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. 
He said the word of God engrafted unto your spirit will save your soul. The word of God engrafted into your spirit will deliver you from every circumstance of life. If you have the word for it, get it into your spirit and it will deliver you. If you will continually believe and, and affirm that I don't care how big the mountain looks, you should not be moved by what you see. You should only be mm -hmm. motivated by what you believe. The word is the final authority. Partakers of the divine nature of God. In 2 Peter 1.4, whereby or by this, by the divine ability of God, we are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. What nature? The divine nature of God. He said that you are partakers of God's nature. Praise the Lord, partakers of God's nature. What kind of nature does God have? Righteousness. Righteousness. Not unworthy nature. God does not have that. He is righteousness. He said, You're partakers of the righteousness of God, for he hath made him to be sin for us. For he who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. 11, or 11, 2 Corinthians 5.21 the very nature of God should dominate your spirit when you're born again. Now, it didn't say it automatically dominates your body. That's where a lot of folks have it all squirreled up. When they were born again, they, ought, they thought their body got saved. They thought that their head got saved. Later, they wanted to do some things that were wrong after they were born again. The devil said, if you were saved, you wouldn't want to do that. You must not have received anything. You must not have been saved or you wouldn't have thought those bad thoughts. Well, I have some news for you. Your head didn't get saved. Your body didn't get saved. Your spirit was born again. You were created in the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus with God on the inside. Now, he must permeate outward and the spirit man must bring the body into subjection to the spirit you have to mortify some deeds of your body to go to church to hear god's word or to read this book this body flesh has to be dis disciplined by the word to the word of god your body does not always want to do the things your spirit would do for the flesh lusteth after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are not con these are contrary one to the other so that ye cannot do things that ye would. Galatians 5.17 Sometimes your body will say, O oh Lord, I'd rather not. And the spirit man on the inside of you will say, Get up, body, you're going. Either your spirit or your body is going to dominate you. And when you're born again, your, superior, your spirit is supposed to dominate the body. You'll notice the word supposed to. Sometimes your spirit doesn't dominate because you fail to act on what you know. The word said you are partakers of the divine nature of God. If you are partakers of the divine nature of God, if you are partakers of the divine nature of God and God spoke and caused creation into being, what do you think is going to happen when you start saying something in faith? Jesus said you can have whatsoever you say if you doubt not and believe in your heart the things you are speaking. In the book of James, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, My brethren, not be masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and be and able to bridle the whole body. Now let's read verse 2 in the Amplified Version of the Bible. For we all often stumble and fall and offend in many things. And if anyone does not offend in speech, never say the wrong things. He is a fully developed character and a perfect man, able to control his whole body and to curb his entire nature. Verse 3 says, if we set bits in the horse's mouth and make them obey us, we can turn their whole bodies about. Mm -hmm. The Greek word that has been translated offended in the King James Version of the Bible is translated stumble. And in the Amplified Version, for in many things we stumble. If any man cannot stumble, not in word. Now, doesn't that change the meaning of the situation? If you don't stumble in your wording, 
he said, the same is a perfect man and able to bring his whole nature into obedience. You can understand that. We have stumbled with our words. Now verse 3 in King James Version says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn with their whole, whole bodies. He said the thing that is in the horse's mouth causes that whole, whole horse to turn in any direction. Verse 4, 6. Behold, also the ships which, though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm. Whither so, with so, heresoever the governor list, listeth, even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter of little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on, on fire of hell. The same verses in the Amplified Version say, If we set bits in the horse's mouth to make them obey us, we can turn their whole bodies about. Likewise, look at the ships. Though they are great and are driven through rough winds, are steered by a very small rudder, where, wherever the impulse of the helmsman determines. Even though the tongue is a little member and it can boast of great things. See how much wood or how great a forest a tiny spark can set ablaze? And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of wickedness set among our whole, mem our whole members con con containing and depraving. Yep, containing, I don't know what that word is. And depraving the whole body and setting on fire the wheel of birth. The cycle of man's nature being itself ignited by hell, Gehenna. Let me tell you in common words what he is saying. He said that you could put the bits in a horse mouth and turn his whole body. He said a great, great big ship weighing hundreds of thousands of tons is turned in any direction by a very small rudder on the back of it. Wherever the captain decides to turn it, he goes on and says the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue is put among our members that it can defile the whole body, and it setteth on fire the course of nature of the amplified ways. Or the as the amplified says, the wheel of our birth cycle of man's nature. That means you have inherited good health from your parents. If your grandfather is healthy, if your if your good health just generally runs in your family then more likely you will be healthy. When you buy an insurance policy, you must have a medical examination. The doctor will ask you how healthy your parents and grandparents were, and did they die with this or that. They can tell a lot about how long you're going to live from the answers to those questions. Now the word says that the tongue can stop those natural forces. The tongue can destroy the very course of nature that caused you to be healthy. If you begin to say, I believe I am coming down with something, you probably will. I'll believe that I am taking a cold. I believe that I am taking a cold. You'll get it. I've had people come into the prayer line and say, I'm afraid I've got cancer. Well, I don't have any proof, but I just believe I've got it. The tongue will, says, it says the tongue will set on fire the course of nature. It will destroy the life-giving flow in your in you that God put in you to heal you and make you whole. Everyone has a natural healing power within their body. If you cut your finger, you don't have to be concerned about it. It knows how to heal itself. That healing power is in you. If you go to talk, taking a sickness and disease and defeat, you have released words that will produce after their kind. You can stop the natural healing power that God put in you by the words of your mouth. Many have stopped divine healing the same way by negative words. Verses 7 through 8. Every kind of beast and bird and serpents and, all, and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. Someone said, see, there is no use trying. The Bible says you can't tame it. No man can tame the tongue. The Amplified said, but the human tongue can be tamed by no man, and it is an undisciplined and ir irreconcilable, re restless evil, full of death-bringing poison. And you know, you've got that thing in your mouth. He said, The tongue no man can tame. Can tame. It is unruly evil that is full of deadly poison. It will poison your body, or it will poison your spirit, it will poison your life, or it will put, over, put you over in life if used correctly. 
It will build life, health, and spirit, soul, and body. He said no man could tame it, but thank God the Holy Spirit can. Some have said, what's so good in all that talking in tongues anyway? Then many believe it went out with the apostles. Well, did you see the life of Peter? He was always spouting off of the mouth, and he said what he would, he, and saying what he would do. I'd die for you, he said. Well, I guess so. Jesus was standing right there. Yeah, I'll die for you. Later, someone said, I believe that man is one of them, and tried to accuse Peter of being a follower of Jesus, accuse him of being a Christian, but they couldn't find enough evidence to convict him. No, Peter said, I don't know the man. Those words came right out of his mouth. He didn't have control of his tongue. It was dominated by fear. After the day of Pentecost. But after the day of Pentecost, when Peter was baptized in the Holy Ghost and Spirit, and spoke with tongues, the power of God came inside him. Then Peter stood up and talked three minutes, and in three and three thousand souls were saved. There was power in his words. Then he walked out of the upper room, and the first old man he came to, he said, I don't have any money. My wife keeps the money. But what I've got, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Acts 3.6 That old... That old boy's eyes got big and said, Nobody's ever talked to me like that. Everybody always said, Oh, bless your heart. It'll be worth it all someday. You're just suffering for the Lord. God's trying to teach you something. And when Peter said, Such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He said, I don't know what it is, but I want it. Praise God. Peter took him by the hand and up he came. Peter learned to control his tongue. I don't ever see where Peter got in any more trouble by his rash talking after the day of Pentecost. That ought to tell us something. The power of God started operating in Peter's life after he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost tamed his tongue. He will tame yours if you will let him. If you will take the word of God, the Holy Spirit works on the man from the inside out. Then... From what James said, you see, what you say can cause sickness and disease, or it can stop it. You can drive sickness and disease out of your body with the words of your mouth. Someone said, now that sounds like positive thinking or Christian science. No, it's not Christian science. I don't deny the existence of disease. I deny the right of that disease to exist in this body, because I'm the body of Christ. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Sickness is a curse. The word says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law with being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 13-14. All sickness and disease is under the curse. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will be, Lord, them will be the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Deuteronomy 20, 18, 28, 61. But praise God, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. I can't see where Jesus was ever sick until he became a curse for us on the cross. He was the body of Christ while he was here on earth. But now you are a member of the body of Christ. Therefore, when sickness or diseases try to fasten itself upon your body, you should make this confession. I am the body of Christ. I am redeemed from the curse, and I forbid any sickness or disease to operate in this body. Every organ, every tissue of this body functions in the perfection to which God created it to function. Every organ, every tissue will function properly. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That is the tongue, a creative force, chapter 3. Have a great day.